so thank you all for coming to this uh, 50th anniversary conference for uh, the Department of Applied Mathematics at the University of Washington. Uh, it's my pleasure to uh, have Suzanne Hawley, a Divisional Dean of Natural Sciences, uh, start off the uh, opening remarks. Thanks, Bernard. Um, good morning and welcome to Seattle and to this conference celebrating 50 years of applied mathematics at the University of Washington. I'm Suzanne Hawley, the Divisional Dean for Natural Sciences in the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of Washington. I'm also an astronomer and therefore feel fully justified in saying that applied mathematics is one of the brightest stars in natural sciences, in the college, and in the university. The department presently holds the top ranking in the country jointly with Princeton by the National Research Council. It also runs the largest graduate program in the college with nearly 300 masters and PhD students. More than 10 years ago, Applied Math pioneered professional masters programs on campus and online, providing continuing education for hundreds of working professionals in the Seattle area and across the country. Recently, they've begun offering similar professional master's degrees in compu computational finance and risk management. And next year, in response to the very strong demand for undergraduate STEM majors here at UW, they will begin offering undergraduate degrees in both applied math and computational finance. Applied mathematics is a truly interdisciplinary department with collaborations in the Foster School of Business, the College of Engineering, the College of the Environment, and many departments within the College of Arts and Sciences. Their research topics range from climate modeling to financial markets, from neuroscience and, can and cancer research, as I'm sure will be discussed in your conference over the next few days. So without further ado, let me welcome you again and wish you the best for a successful conference and turn the podium back to Bernard to fill you in on the illustrious history of applied math here at the UW. Um, so this has been up there for about 15 minutes now. Does anybody notice anything wrong with it? <laughs> I'm skipping the last 10 years. So as I was going over this yesterday, I noticed that, oh, that should be 2019. I changed it on my slides on my desktop, but I didn't change it on the memory stick that, you know, that you're looking at now. Um, I'm hoping it's the only error, but uh, of course if I'm talking about the history of the department, there's a number of people in this room who uh, know a lot of the, de the details a lot better than I do. Um, so yeah, maybe I'll get some more corrections. Um, so before I talk about the conference and all the great things that we have for you, uh, let me just uh, present a very brief uh, history of, of what started 50 years ago. Um, I should say the background slide, uh, it's a little bit faint of course, um, you have uh, the seven previous chairs of the department slash program slash group slash committee, and I'll get all of that, uh, looking at you. Um, and I'm not on there, but I'm here looking at you, so that, that'll work. Um, okay, so in 1969, uh, Professor Carl Pearson right there, um, after uh, arriving from Boeing a couple of years earlier, became the director of the Applied Mathematics Committee. This was an advisory body that was going to recommend the, to the administration what steps should be undertaken for uh, applied mathematics. Um, you know, in terms of whether there should be uh, separate instruction or whether it should be spread out across all departments on campus and so on. Um, so um, that started in 1969, so 50 years ago. Uh, Carl had an appointment in uh, both aeronautical engineering and uh, mathematics. Um, Yesterday, um, I have a bunch of documents, historical documents from the department, and one of them is a three-page letter that uh, Carl wrote to somebody uh, who asked about the early history of the department. And the main thing I took away from that letter is that I'm very grateful that Carl stuck with it because there was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of fighting back. There was a lot of... Uh, you know, a lot of resistance from different bodies, different administrative bodies, mostly off campus. Um, uh, for instance, Washington State had, just before this effort started, changed the name of their department to the Department of uh, Mathematics and Applied Mathematics. And they claimed that because they had applied mathematics in their name, that they had the prerogative on applied mathematics education in the state. Uh, so that was, you know, one kind of argument that had to be fought. 
Uh, and there were many others in, uh, that are described in the letter, which is actually a very good read. Um, so that's 1969. Uh, in 1972, the committee becomes the Applied Mathematics Group and is tasked with teaching undergraduate, uh, is, tas is tasked with teaching Applied Mathematics courses on campus. Um, in 1976, um, the group gets the authority to grant masters and PhD degrees. And I think also at this point, uh, Bill Criminali, is Bill here? Okay. Uh, we'll see Bill later, I hope. Uh, Bill Criminali uh, became the chair of the group. There is Bill, uh, and then uh, Jerry Kevorkian couldn't be here. He just had surgery. Uh, he wished he could be here. Uh, you'll see why I'm putting up the different pictures of the different people in a second. Um, so in 1982, the Applied Mathematics program uh, was founded coming, from, uh, coming out of the group. This was following a uh, five-year review of the group in 1981. Uh, of an internal and external committee that came up with the main conclusion that the uh, group should become a department based in the uh, College of Engineering. That recommendation was not followed. Um, so here is uh, Terry Rockefeller and here's uh, Fred Wan, who became in 1985 the first chair of the Department of Applied Mathematics. Is Fred or Terry here? Hi, Fred. Um, the reason that I'm, I've shown you the five pictures I've shown you is that this is the document, this was the original proposal to start the Department of Applied Mathematics in 1985. So reading Carl's letter, everything from 1969 to 1982 was really like pulling teeth. But then this was uh, June 85 and then July 1st, 85, we were a department. So at some point things accelerated, but in the beginning things were very hard. Um, so, uh, I, so I've shown you a picture of Bill, Jerry, uh, Terry, Fred, and then I've also shown you Carl, and then uh, these people left the, didn't stay too long after 1985 with the department. This is a snapshot of the department in 1990. This is all the faculty members in 1990. I'll let you uh, stare at that. For those of you who go back to those days, uh, I'll let you look at that for a little bit. Uh, there's, there's some pictures, for instance, Chris definitely looks like he's very young, uh, as does Mark and so on. Uh, KK hasn't changed at all. Um, and then there's Carl at the center. Uh, most of these pictures were in Guggenheim Hall, which was the historical home of the department coming out of aeronautical engineering, uh, with the exception, I think, of this one, which is Terry Rockefeller in a Padelford office, uh, looking at the bricks in the background there. Okay. So what has happened uh, since then? In 1989, I'm not sure I have that year wrong, but around there, uh, the department first started getting involved in distance education. This was, um, a lot of that was sending VHS tapes to Boeing. Um, I was gonna include a picture of a VHS tape to, for those of you who've never seen one or don't know what that is. Um, in 1997, the department uh, started, uh, together with mathematics, statistics, and computer science, the ACMS major. Uh, and that's still going on and still going strong. In 2007, we started the online master's in applied mathematics uh, that Suzanne also mentioned. Uh, and then in 2010, we got the number one uh, National Research Council ranking joint with Princeton. In 2011, we added the computational finance and risk management uh, program. And then in 2013, we moved to Lewis Hall. Uh, and for those of you who've only been in, in Guggenheim, uh, that's Lewis Hall in the background. We can't give you a tour or show you Lewis Hall in more detail because Lewis Hall is currently undergoing a seismic uh, upgrade. Uh, but you can, you can see the outside surrounded by all kinds of construction. Uh, but that's what it looks like. Um, this year, Chris Bretterton became the first member of the department elected to the National Academy of Science. And as Suzanne mentioned, uh, hopefully soon, uh, hopefully in winter quarter, we've been told, uh, we might have uh, an applied math undergraduate degree and a CFRM uh, undergraduate degree on the books. So fingers crossed for that. So where are we now? Uh, we are the largest graduate program in the College of Arts and Sciences with uh, close to 300 uh, PhD and master's students. Uh, that is over 20 graduate students per faculty member, which is a far greater ratio than 
definitely any department in the college, and I can't really think of any uh, departments on campus that maybe the, maybe the high school that get close to that. Um, the expertise of the department has changed over time. Uh, now, um, I mean, some of it has stayed the same. Uh, now we have expertise in climate sciences, data science, dynamical systems, financial mathematics, fluids, mathematical biology, medical science, numerical analysis, optimization, partial differential equations, stochastics, and I'm sure that's not the end of it. Um, so, but that's the end of the history of the department. Uh, so I think the department clearly has come a long way from fighting a lot of uh, resistance to its formation and, and the kind of the first 20 years uh, to where we are now with uh, you know, such, a, such a large department in terms of the number of its uh, faculty, postdoc, and student members. Um, so what I uh, want to finish off the opening comments with is I just want a brief description of what we have for you uh, at this conference. So we've got uh, some of you already attended the two-day workshop, the, um, Monday and, and Tuesday, yesterday. Um, and so what we have coming up today, Thursday, and Friday, uh, an exciting conference, about 250 participants. Uh, we're going to have five excellent plenary speakers, uh, one about to start. Uh, we're going to have a number of very interesting panels, hopefully with we'll a lot of audience participation. And of course, we have a lot of uh, parallel sessions as well. Uh, and then this evening, uh, we have a poster session with, uh, last count I was aware of, about 34 posters or so. Uh, and then uh, at the poster session, there will also be uh, dinner provided, so uh, please hang around for that. Um, one remark about a change in the schedule. Richard Branyuk, who was going to be this afternoon's plenary speaker, uh, had to cancel. Uh, last, time, uh, last I heard, he's still in France right now waiting for an airplane part to arrive. Uh, so it's better that he doesn't travel without that. Um, but uh, our own Randy Levesque uh, has stepped in, and he's going to uh, do a fabulous job, I'm sure. Uh, and uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to uh, Nathan and Peter. Nathan Kutz will introduce Peter Schmidt. Thank you. All right. Well, I get the, uh, the great pleasure to introduce to you Peter Schmidt, who will kick us off uh, for the conference. Uh, so Peter was a, a faculty member here uh, quite a number of years ago now. Uh, when did you, so when I first came, Peter was uh, sort of, I would consider my contemporary. Oh, no. <laughs> he, was the one, he was the closest to my age, let's say it that way. Uh, uh, fantastic person, worked on a really interesting diversity of problems. The students loved him. He was known to be very hard and difficult, but also worth the effort. Uh, since that time, he moved to France. He was in Paris for quite a number of years and now is at Imperial College. Uh, and interestingly enough, this is where I've started to actually, from a professional view, uh, interact more with Peter. Uh, and I want to highlight one of the things that he's done he will not be talking about today. Uh, but he developed this method called dynamic mode decomposition, which is actually being uh, used quite a bit across the engineering physical sciences. It's a data-driven method for sort of discovering dynamics out of systems. Uh, in fact, I was just at a coffee shop earlier today where I saw Peter come in, and the student next to me was talking. I said, that's, uh, that's Peter Schmidt over there. Oh, Peter, I, got, I got to go meet him because everybody uh, is you know, using DMD for different applications and methods. It's something that I use quite a bit in my own work and uh, really comes down to some of the really pioneering contributions. That's one of them that Peter has made uh, among many uh, and has done quite a bit in the fluids community. Uh, you'll see this very interesting talk here today as well on binary mixing. I've already actually seen parts of it, right? So uh, anyway, it's a fascinating talk and it's just such a pleasure to have Peter back here home. Okay. Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks, Nathan, and thanks the orga. Thanks for the invitation to the organizers. It's uh, really great, great to be back, uh, walking down memory lane. Uh, the nine years I spent here were very uh, memorable and very formative for me. So it's, it's, I'm very, very happy to be part of this uh, festivities and celebration of 50 years of applied math. So uh, I want to talk about uh, how to mix binary fluids. This is a project we've been working on for the last, let's say, five, six years. And I want to acknowledge Maximilian Egel, the graduate student that actually works on that, who will defend his thesis in about three weeks from now. 
Uh, so uh, if you go back to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to the start, uh, if you hit Wikipedia and just want to know what mixing is all about, the definition of mixing is making heterogeneous physical systems uh, homogeneous by using manipulating operations. So it's very vague. A uh, lot of things fall under mixing. Uh, but uh, we're going to get it a little bit more specific in a, in a, in a, in a, in a few slides. Uh, I think I don't have to argue much that mixing is very important in a variety of physical and technological processes. Food and beverage industry, uh, once we break for, uh, for lunch, for example, you will certainly eat something that has been mixed. Uh, pharmaceutical industry probably has the highest standard of this homogeneous part. Uh, you want to have a certain dosage in your medication so that uh, one pill is not a placebo and the next one uh, is, is, uh, is toxic. So there is the highest standard of, of uh, mixing consistency there. Consumer product industry, adhesives, glues, shampoos, toothpaste, everything like this has to be mixed at some point from the, from the, the ingredients that it's made of. Civil and chemical engineering, same thing. Wastewater management has a lot of mixing. Polymers need to be mixed before they get produced. Oil and gas industry, refining technologies, biofuels, it all involves at some point mixing water and uh, the pulp and paper industry. And then also natural mixing, not just industrial mixing, also natural mixing. Uh, that's the part that we can manipulate uh, less so, but nevertheless, there's lots of mixing there, natural mixing, nutrient transport in the oceans and the atmosphere. And uh, just to give you a little bit of a, of a motivation for that one, in 2007, according to the Handbook of Mixing, the U.S. lost about one billion U.S. dollars due to incomplete or inefficient mixing. Okay? So we're trying to optimize this a little bit, but you see already by the number of one billion there, even if you make a 1% or a 2% or a very, very modest improvement, that one translates into a lot of money. Okay. So what are we going to do as a setup? We're trying to formulate that one as an optimization problem. We want to have maximal mi mixing, and I'm going to specify what maxial, uh, maximal means. Maximal mixing with the least energy expenditure, right? as usual. We want to get the biggest uh, bang for the buck. Uh, that's an optimization problem, obviously, with constraints. And the constraints will be uh, manifold. Two of them will be on the time horizon that we give ourselves. We don't want to mix forever at, after some time as it has elapsed, we want to be done with the mixing, or as far as we can. And we also want to limit the expended energy. Okay? So minimal effort with maximum outcome, as usual for an optimization problem. Now, just to clean up with some kind of a misconception that has been around for many, many years, that minimal effort with maximum outcome is very, very uh, conducive to say, OK, Minimal effort, let's use an instability in the flow, right? So if the flow happens to have some kind of a natural way of amplifying itself, that would be the cheapest way of getting something into the system with a minimal effort, okay? So for many, many years, uh, this has been the kind of mixing strategy if you don't have any better ideas, okay? And we want to clean up with this one right away. So we did a uh, first attempt and try to see, is this actually true? Is an instability a good mixer? So very, very simple setup. We have channel flow. It's about as simple as it gets, two parallel walls. We have a posse flow, a parabolic profile going through it. And the bottom is fluid one, the blue one, and the top is the white one. And we want to manipulate from the wall by, by normal blowing and suction strategy any way we want to over a certain time horizon and with a limited energy budget and see where, how we can stir up this white and blue into a nice light blue mixture that is homogeneous. Okay, that's the, that's the, the thing. So I'm going to show you two cases. The first case is we're going to optimally force an instability in the flow. Now this flow has some kind of instabilities that we can exploit and we're going to exploit them maximally and see what happens. And then the second one is we're not caring much about the instability. We just want to get the job done. We want to have the mixing uh, targeted as an objective directly rather than through an instability. The imposed constraints, as I said, limited time and limited energy. Okay. So I'm going to show you two movies. 
uh, they all they, they they look the same on on the on the setup. On the bottom, we have the the passive scalar, so theta is equal to zero in one, and theta is equal to one in the other, just like an indicator of what fluid you actually have. The second one from the bottom is the velocity field, and the top is uh, the top two are showing you the control strategy that the optimization found as the best one. Okay, so let me kick that one off. So this one is targeting a instability in the flow, piggybagging along, and hoping that the thing leads to Leads, leads to a, uh, a mixed state. Okay, so we're going to blow in from the side, from the top and the bottom. You see that? Time horizon is 20. We're approaching 20. You see how things are getting stirred up. Now, hands off. Okay, so now the control strategy is switched off. Okay, now if you have rest momentum, of course, this one still continues to mix. Diffusion sets in, but at the end of the day, the bottom is still blue and the top is still white and not much has happened. We just squandered all of our energy into the instability. It certainly grew and did something, but at the end it did not mix. Okay? So now let's do case number two. That one is now targeting the mixedness directly, independent of whether there's an instability or not. Okay? And wh what we target, I'm going to tell you a little bit later, what is mixedness? Okay? Now, the, the thing I want to point out, this is the control strategy over 20 units. Okay? And you see that this is almost the same thing. What that means, this is an XT diagram. This is T, this is X. Okay? It's like a peristaltic wave. It's a wave that pushes the fluid through. And if you look at the case here and the optimal mixing case there, well, it's almost the same. It's that, uh, that, that wave that is pushing down the sidewalls. Okay. But there's definitely a difference here. This one is mostly red. This one has striations. Okay. So this one uses the energy very differently. Overall the same, but in, in details there's, there's quite a difference. So it's a little bit more jerky in a sense. Okay. So let's kick that off and see whether that does a better job. Okay. Starts out the same way. You, try to, you need to get to the interface and stir it up first. Okay. Time 10. Halfway done. So you see it overturns it. It uses the shear very, very differently. And 20 is coming and hands off. And this one is nicely mixed. Okay. So what we target here is actually not an instability. It's a, we play around with the shear, moving around the fluid from one shear area to the other so that it gets torn up into long filaments because the optimization knows that by the time 20 comes along, the only motion that is left for mixing is diffusion. And if you have long filaments, they diffuse nicely and become a homogeneous mixture. Okay? So in that case, the, the, the control strategy is like a momentum-driven precursor for a diffusion-driven mixing at the end. Okay? All right. So, hydrodynamic instabilities are inefficient mixers. We should not even consider them. The instabilities concentrate on the large scales if you have an instability, because most fluid instabilities live here. What we need is a cascade to smaller scales, okay? and then diffusion kicks in at the higher scales. So that transport to smaller scales is that filament building through motion through a shear. Okay? So mixing has to generate flow filaments by using shear, and then the mixing by diffusion kicks in at the end. All right, now, this is what we had as, as, a, as a sort of a, a starting experiment to rule out or, the, or to have arguments for not using instabilities. But we actually wanted to mix by geometry, not by blowing and suction. But we're not targeting an instability. All right, so this is the physical model that we're going to deal with. We're going to have a binary fluid that's only two fluid components, and they're both Newtonian. We're going to do the non-Newtonian a little bit later. Most of the industry is non-Newtonian. Toothpaste, shampoo, all that is, is actually non-Newtonian. We're going to use incompressible flow. That's a pretty good assumption. Two-dimensional for now. We can go 3D easily. A Reynolds number of 1,000. And the reason we have the Reynolds number of 1,000 is twofold. Okay. This is somehow the 1,000 Reynolds number is the sweet spot between something that is too low in Reynolds number, and then you have Stokes mixing, which is reversible. Okay. There's a whole literature on that one that we didn't want to do. Okay. We want to have something that is irreversible. 
But the thousand is not big enough for turbulence to kick in and make our life hard. Okay? So it's right in that, in, that, in that middle range where we have inertial effects but no turbulence yet. And a lot of industrial uh, mixing things are actually at the range of 1,000. It's not like we're limiting ourselves here. We have a cylindrical vessel with two cylindrical stirrers on circular paths. So the whole setup looks like this. So think of this as a Petri dish. The bottom is, is uh, fluid one. The top is fluid zero. Theta is zero as a passive scalar. And we have two circular stirrers, like egg beaters, that go around on a circular path. And we want to optimize various things. I will show you two, two results that we have. The first one will optimize the speed on the circular path. Okay? So they plunge through it and stir the whole thing up over a finite time horizon with a finite uh, energy. The mathematical model, a little bit of equations. This is the applied math department, so I have to have some equations at some point. Uh, Navier-Stokes equations, incompressible, very simple. And that's augmented by a advection diffusion equation for the passive scalar. It gets advected by the fluid velocity diffused by itself. Okay, the Peclet number is also about 1,000. What is 1,000? And on the stirrers, we have no slip boundary conditions for the velocity. And we have no penetration boundary conditions for the passive scalar. Okay, so a mix of directly Neumann boundary conditions for the embedded geometry. How do we embed the geometry? Well, we do that with what's called Brinkmann penalization. We define a mask that is one in the solid and zero outside. And if you augment it, your, your, uh, your Navier-Stokes equations, additional terms come in that enforce the boundary conditions through a relaxation step. Okay? And we have to do that in two different ways. In the U velocity, we have directly boundary conditions. So that Brinkmann penalization, as it's called, shows up like this. In the passive scalar, we have to have Neumann zero gradient boundary condition as we hit the solid. So they come in a little bit differently in the diffusion coefficient uh, like this. Okay? Now, we have just two control variables. One is the mask itself. So as we play around with the mask and we optimize with respect to the mask, we, we actually do shape optimization. So I can say, is a circular stirrer the best shape we can get? Or should I do a square or a triangle or a star shape or, or something else? Okay? That one we're gonna, I'm going to show you uh, at the end. What we first do is the control variable, the velocity of the circular stirrer. We leave, we leave the cross-sectional uh, area intact. And we just optimize the speed around the circular path okay, for a mixing strategy optimization. Right. OK, just a little bit of implementation details. We didn't start from scratch. We actually used a code that is openly available called Fluzy by Kai Schneider. It's a fluid structure interaction code, but we took it apart. Uh, it's a spectral Fourier-based discretization, doubly periodic domain, but the domains are actually buffered from each other by a sponge layer, so it's actually uh, doubly periodic just for numerical convenience. Uh, the nonlinear terms, we have to be very careful and use uh, anti-aliasing. We do that with a Li Hao filter. The grid mass transfer is done by a mollified uh, delta function, very standard, uh, for example, boundary uh, uh, immersed uh, boundary technique or something. And it's highly parallelizable, runs on clusters uh, with many, many processes uh, because of the fast Fourier transform. All right, so now we have to come to the objective. What do we actually want to accomplish with the, with the optimization? So as I said, we want to en enhance mixedness over a given time horizon with a finite control energy budget, okay? We already ruled up the way we don't want to do it, but now we have to come to the point where we have to define the mixedness. We want to target the mixedness directly, as I showed you in the beginning, works much better. It's mathematically uh, uh, quite a hard problem, actually, but there has been, there has been some uh, progress lately. A very common option that is used is using the variance of the passive scalar. Uh, the definition is, is uh, based on the fluctuations from the mean, and perfect mixing is uh, when the concentration is equal to the mean. Uh, in that case, the variance goes down to zero. And it's an L2 measure, so it's nice to optimize over. Okay? 
But the problem is, if you write down the equation, the evolution equation for the variance, the advection doesn't even show up. And we already know advection is a very, very important piece. Of course, the advection is implicitly in the gradient, but it's not explicitly there. On top of that, our diffusion coefficient is quite high. So you see that in our case, in our parameter regime, dt of the variance is almost zero, or very, very small. And it's very hard to make progress on that or see how to improve the mixing strategy. Okay? We're going to go for option number two. There's been some work in 2007 by Message and Petzold, Matthew and Tifo on mixed norm, special norms that maximize that mixing and have the right balance of small scales to, to large scales that actually describe a mixing process much, much more uh, uh, appropriately. Okay. And we have to define, the, so the norm is like this. It's the gradient, the Nabla operator, to a negative and fractional power. So it's a Sobolev norm of negative index with fractional uh, indices. Now, the way to understand that is to go through the Fourier domain and basically say that nabla, which is, one, which is ik to the minus 1, so it's like an integral. Okay? And we can actually have, so, so, so the, the, the large scales are, are kept, the, 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 the smaller scales for higher wave numbers are tapered off. Okay? And by choosing this index, we can basically tell, we can, we can tune the filter in wave numbers and the emphasis of large scale to small scales as we please. Okay? Now, this one is for Fourier uh, analysis. You see the 1 over k squared. If you are on a finite domain, the 1 over k squared would be a solution to a Poisson problem. Okay? In our case, we choose q is, two, is 2 thirds. We choose a fractional power. There are some arguments about that that go quite deep into ergodic theory. But uh, this is, this is the, the one we take. So we take the gradient to the power of minus 2 third of our, of our uh, passive scalar concentration. And that's the measure of mixedness, how well we're actually doing. And that one takes exactly into account all the, the scales that are active during the mixing, the ones that we want to manipulate. All right. Um, we have a finite control budget. I already said that. We take the mixed norm. There's one problem with that mixed norm, and that is it only cares about the passive scalar. Okay? But we have a dynamic equation that has an evolution equation for the passive scalar and an evolution equation for the velocity as well. But the velocity never shows up in our optimization output. Okay? This is known as a semi-norm problem. So we can actually stuff all kind of energy into the fluid velocity because it never shows up at the cost functional. Okay? So we have, it, it's a little bit like not specifying a boundary condition and the solution is flapping in the breeze. Okay? So we're going to get to that one. We have to have additional constraints that actually put the optimization scheme into a, into a well-posed problem. All right. So here's the optimization. We have an objective, our mixed norm. We want to minimize that one. The lower it is, the better it's mixed. Okay? Subject to constraints. And the constraints are time horizon, energy budget, and we have to satisfy the governing equation. We cannot just uh, optimize into the blue. The way we turn that around is we're going to add the constraints to the cost functional by Lagrange multiplier or adjoint variables and optimize the whole augmented Lagrangian. So by taking the first variation with respect to the Lagrangian to zero with respect to all its independent variables, we get the governing equation for the, the optimization problem, the karash kun tucker equations, the KKT system. Right? Number one, the First one gives us the constraints back, so we get our equations back, the Navier-Stokes equations. That's one output. That's the cheapest one that we knew ahead of time. The other ones, we have to work a little bit harder. The governing equation, we also get a governing equation for these Lagrange multipliers. They have their own PDE that they satisfy. Okay? And then the last one, which is the most important one, is if we take the first variation with respect to the control variables, the speed along the path or the shape, the masks, then we get the optimality condition. Okay? So once we have these three equations, this is how we patch them together. Okay? 
We're going to have the governing equations. That's one output from the first variation. That's our nonlinear PDE, the nonlinear Navier-Stokes equations plus the passive scalar. In the beginning, we don't have a mixing strategy, so we guess something, like going around the path with a constant speed. That's sort of a good guess. Okay? We integrate forward over the time horizon. That's a nonlinear PDE. Okay? Then we're going to take this one and evaluate the cost functional. And the cost functional, the form of the cost functional, goes into the adjoint variable. So this is the set of equations for our adjoint variables. We integrate that one backwards in time from capital T back to zero. Okay? Now, this is the cost functional. It has a two-thirds derivative up here. This one enters here. So suddenly you're mixing integer derivatives with fractional derivatives. So this is a pseudo-differential equation, but at least it's linear. Okay? What comes out there is the adjoint variables that carry sensitivity gradient information. And that gradient information goes into our cost functional gradient. Once we have that gradient, you pick your favorite optimization routine, steepest descent, conjugate gradient, whatever you have, Newton. Okay? You add constraints, making sure you're not outside the bounds of what you give yourself as a control strategy, and then tells you how to do better next time around. So this goes in as the improved mixing strategy, and then you go around and around and around until nothing changes anymore, and then you reach a zero gradient and a minimum. Okay. Now, this is a nonlinear PDE. There is one last thing we have to actually acknowledge. The, the, for, the, the backward problem, so the adjoint problem, depends on the solutions of the forward problem because this is nonlinear. So, so in that case, we have to actually store all the snapshots that we produce with our DNS on the way forward because we need it in the reverse order on the way back. Okay. In 2D, we can actually afford to store quite a bit, okay? but if we go to 3D, that one is impossible. You run out of uh, memory right away, and then you don't store everything. You just store it at certain strategic locations, and you recover the forward problem as you need it on the fly from these stored away initial conditions. Okay? So it's called checkpointing. But this is the scheme. This is the scheme that we have. All right. So now I'm going to show you the results of what the optimization is trying to do uh, for, for uh, certain conditions. But before I show you something, let's just go through mentally and see what we would, have, what we would do. Okay? So if you have a setup like this, okay, what is an obvious mixing strategy? The first thing you say, well, let's just plunge through the interface, right? the egg beater strategy. You go there and you deform the interface, increasing the small scales, the filaments, and so on, by just dragging that cylinder many times through the interface and stirring up your dough, just like you do with baking, okay? Or the coffee and the milk. Okay. That's one strategy. Once that, that's the one we actually expected. Okay? But then once, we, once the first optimization came back, the optimizer did something totally different. Okay? It didn't even plunge through the interface. What it did is the second strategy, and that's a vortex cannon. Okay? So what it does is it jiggles the, 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 the cylinders back and forth, generating shed vortices every time it jiggles it back and forth, and then shoots these vortices towards the interface, but not going through the interface by itself, displacing it. Okay? So it's this game where you do a vortex cannon and you shoot a vortex ring. Very much uh, like this. Another thing that we saw is once, once the time is up and we don't optimize anymore, the, you would think that the cylinders have no, uh, no, no uh, role whatsoever, but they can still be in a strategic location parked there for the vortices to come back and then split on them. Okay? So obstruction is another one that the whole thing can optimize. And then also, of course, you can generate these vortices and play them against each other and make them collide. Okay? So that's the four strategies that we've seen. Uh, there's actually a fifth one where you, you bash a, a vortex. You generate one and then let it bash into the wall and split on the wall. But that's the same as the, the obstruction. Okay. All right. Um, just a recap of what we do here. Range number is 1,000. Pectin number is 1,000. The, the whole resolution is uh, 1,024 by 1,024. 
uh, we've done resolution studies, so everything is resolved. And I'm going to show you uh, movies that go over 32 time units. But in terms of optimization, we only have information up to t is equal to 8. Okay? So no matter how we optimize, we always know what happens over 8 units. Okay? But the control strategy has its own limitations. Okay? So we can say, okay, we know what happens over eight units, but we say control it only over one unit. Okay? Even if you know what happens later on, do what you need to do in one unit. Okay? Or we also have the long ones where we give the entire length of what we have information for. So we have a predictive horizon and an actuation horizon. Okay. All right. So this is, the, this is the first result, the, the first cylinder. Okay? So we give ourselves uh, t is equal to 1. That, by the way, is enough to make it to the interface. Okay? So this cylinder, if it wants to, could actually reach the interface and plunge through it. Okay? Um, but uh, what actually happens is the following. Okay? It doesn't go to the interface. It jiggles back and forth, okay? sheds the vortices, and then lets the vortex do the rest. Okay? And the entire energy is spent not getting very far, but accelerating like mad, okay? back and forth. All the energy goes into the jerky motion rather than going to the interface and plunging through it. What I show you on the right is a, a vorticity trace just to guide the eye a little bit of what ha actually happens. So this is, it goes back and forth. This is all the vorticity that it generates capped at the, I think, top quartile. And then this is, this is like the, the vorticity dances around and mixes up the interface. Unfortunately, it's not quite synchronized. Okay? But just to give you an idea of what are the stirring elements that the flow generates in that, in that, uh, in that instance. Okay. So we see that for a short time horizon, the mixing strategy one doesn't even come in, doesn't plunge. It, does, it, makes, it takes a lot of advantage of the vortex cannon strategy. There's certainly also obstruction and the vortex collision. Okay. That's the three strategy that it plays with in various uh, combinations and superpositions. So this is just one test cylinder to, to see uh, what it actually picks. Now we're going to add a second test cylinder on a second circular path, and now they actually can cooperate and shoot each other vortices towards each other. Okay. Okay. And again, it's even worse because they hardly move at all. I, I would have to go and really go step by step. It's all resolved in time. They just do a little bit of a spasm, like, like kind of a jerk around, and, and shed, uh, generate a lot of vortices. And these vortices actually do the job, not the cylinder that does the job. Okay. But it does a pretty good, uh, um, a pretty good uh, job of uh, optimizing the whole thing and getting the mixing done. Again here, you see there's an entire cloud. We only track the top ones, but there are a lot more. Okay, so it's really just a jerky motion. In that case, again, vortex cannon strategy, obstruction, and the vortex collision. Now, as I said, what, what, what actually um, um, uh, compromises the whole, uh, uh, op uh, the whole optimization is we're dealing with a semi-norm constraint. Okay? And the semi-norm constraint limits the passive scalar, but the velocity of the flow field is not part of the optimization. Okay? We're going to have an energy penalization on the stirrers, but not on the fluid velocity. So the optimization is tending towards more and more and higher acceleration strategies. It knows that the faster it accelerates, the more vortices and the stronger vortices it can shed. And of course, if you don't limit that one because of a semi-norm constraint, then we're going to go into that more and more, and the whole thing just drifts away. There is no limit to it. It goes higher and higher in terms of acceleration. 
So it's the Stokes layers that are shed off the cylinders that do the mixing, not the stirrer that does the mixing. Okay, so we get a divergence of, the, of optimization, as you would expect from a semi-norm optimization strategy. Okay, so we have to have additional constraints. So what we do now is we, we also, since the strategy is based on acceleration, because acceleration generates these vortices that do the stirring, we now limit the acceleration. So it's like a total variation constraint on top of the energy constraint. Okay? So if we do this one, now we actually limit the jerky motion. And suddenly, strategies that were suboptimal before, because there were so much better strategies than plunging through it, become now viable candidates. Okay? So if you do an acceleration penalization, still a very small time horizon. We say, get it done quickly. We actually have mixing by all strategy. And now, the plunging through it is actually a viable mixing strategy that is used together with the vortex cannon and everything else in it. Okay. So this one is probably one of the best mixing results we had, the fastest one with the least amount of energy. Okay. So now acceleration, by, by, by saying we have a penalization of acceleration, acceleration cannot be faster than a certain uh, a certain amount, that one translates now into an indirect velocity constraint on the governing equations, okay? Through unsteady vorticity dynamics that is shed from the stirrer elements, okay? So we have now uh, the acceleration, penalization closes the, the optimization, and now it's not a semi-norm constraint. That acceleration penalization closes out the velocity constraints, and now everything is fine and convergent. Okay. If you give uh, a little bit of a, uh, a, longer, a longer time horizon with the same amount, then, of course, it doesn't need to get everything done in one time unit. It now can take it a little bit easier and has eight minutes or eight, eight units to get the same job done, and now it's a much, much milder strategy, something that is a little bit more forgiving on the bearings of the whole system. Okay, so uh, you, you sacrifice a little bit in terms of mixing strategy, everything goes a little bit slower, but you see again that this one works quite well. Also, what you should see here is, is as this, 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 um, the cylinder is going towards the interface, it breaks a few times. It's a jerky motion. It first moves to the interface, then it stops, then it accelerates again, it stops. It even stops right on the interface rather than plunging through because it knows every time it stops, the shed vortices actually will overtake it and do additional stirring that it cannot do by itself by just plunging through it. Okay? So it generates vortices all the time as it goes through. Okay. All right, and again, all the mixing strategies are there. Oops. All the mixing strategies are there. Let, let, let me just show this one one more time. So uh, watch, watch this one uh, go through. It goes, it stops, it goes, it stops on the interface now, and then up, 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 you know, it just goes through. And then as it stops at the end, of course, oops, I'm doing this again. As it, stops at the, as it stops at the end, it also sheds the last stopping vortex that, uh, that moves, that uh, distorts the interface right over there. This guy is coming up, stopping now, and then this one is from the stop vortex of this one, distorting the interface even more. OK, so plenty to play with. What we've learned is that uh, only the energy of the st if, if only the energy stirrer is is uh, is, uh, is penalized, okay, then uh, the stirrer takes advantage of the shed vortices that are actually unpenalized. If you don't uh, if you don't penalize acceleration, you get almost like an infinite amount of shed vortices that you can generate, and they do the stirring. Okay, so it's an open problem, an open optimization problem. Uh, Acceleration-based is the way most effective for only energy uh, penalization. 
Uh, obstruction and vortex collision are secondary. The most of the stuff is done by the vortex cannon strategy. Okay. If you have a shorter time window with equal energy, that one gives better results. And if you then uh, also penalize the acceleration, then you have an interplay of all four strategies. But as you see from, from the from the, the, mixing, the mixing norms that we get, there is you know, not all that much difference between them. Shorter time horizon, where you rush the whole mixing a little bit, gives you better results. The lower, the better, by the way. Okay? So this is the mix norm. The lower, the better you get mixed. All right. So gradient-based optimization is actually quite effective. It's, it's uh, definitely going in a direction that we did not anticipate. Uh, we thought we just sort of plunged through it, but it showed us uh, uh, quite a variety of, of uh, mixing strategies that we did not anticipate up to that degree. Okay. Uh, it's very good in producing enhanced mixing strategies, and as I said, a little bit goes a long way in terms of money. Uh, the numerical scheme was actually quite robust. Uh, Brinkman penalization was, was quite nice. Uh, we never had any problems with, uh, that, that came from the numerics. The fractional mix norms are essential in, uh, in, uh, in arriving at that. We also did the same, the same optimization with the variance, and it was not even close. Okay? So you have to really concentrate on how you measure the mixedness before you can actually tailor your strategies to, to, uh, to, to better mix. Okay? So additional constraints are the key here. They're necessary to converge to feasible strategies. All right. So let's go back. That was the path optimization strategy. But I said we have two things we can play with. And the other one is a shape optimization. Okay. So uh, the shape optimization was given by the mask. Okay. And the mask now determines the cross-sectional shape of our stirrers. So this is the flip coin of the, of the optimization. It's the same system. Okay. The gradients, of course, now change a little bit. And also, uh, the, the, uh, so most, most of the changes are actually here. Okay? So in that case, we don't go on a path. We fix the stirrers. We want to see the, uh, the, the, the effect of shape separate uh, uh, from the path. Eventually, of course, we want to mix we want to mix the two strategies and then have path optimization and shape optimization at the same time. Okay? But one thing at a time. That's probably something for the next student. Uh, so uh, this is the, the, the gradient with respect to the mask. We have the possibility of doing very fine adjustments, but that has a control parameter space that is way too large. Okay. So we parameterize our cross-sectional um, cross uh, shape by a Fourier curve, a parametric Fourier curve. So we pick five Fourier coefficients and parameterize x of t and y of t, the shape of the stirrer. Okay? And by doing that, we can more or less cover everything from a circle to an ellipse to a hypocycloid to a hypertrochoid, and so on and so on. Okay? So we're going to just play with the coefficients, bring down the high dimensional control space to just a few, a few parameters. We could also have used Bezier curves and play with the control points. But the Fourier one seemed the easiest one. Okay. So here is what we start out with. We're going to start out with uh, uh, a hypocycloid. This is uh, a start. And then we say, OK, change it the way you want so that you get over one rotation. Just one rotation is the time horizon. With a fixed uh, rotational speed, the maximum st uh, uh, mix norm of the interface. Okay. So you can, you can imagine the first part doesn't do so well. Okay? That's, that's our initial condition. No optimization whatsoever. And then if you go for the second one, it has this paddle. We had to stop at some point. We're, we're, we're still playing with this one. Otherwise, this little thing would have broken off. Uh, so we have to have some kind of a better way. We, we have some algorithm that, that, uh, that limits or penalizes self-intersection of the, of the, uh, of the, of the cross-sectional area. But uh, it's still not working so well. Okay? So we have to stop the optimization. But you see that it already mixes a lot better than it mixes over there. And it's not just a straight paddle. It, it plays with 
the vortices in the cavity that get rolled up in the cavity and at some point ejected out to collide with what's been shed on the, on the, on, as a, on the, on the trailing edge of this one. Okay, so it's a nice interplay and the shape adapts quite nicely to that. Okay. So this is the next one. The next one we have five of those in a, in a, in a row. And uh, we placed two of them out there, okay, and uh, three of them on the line. Okay. And, and, uh, and then let, let the, the shape optimization do its job. And what it comes up with is something like this, okay. It hardly touches these guys. There is no point in there because over one rotation, there's not really anything going towards them where they could actually contribute. They just stir within their own color, okay, and that's not contributing to to, to anything else, so but it, it, it deforms these guys quite a bit, and um, we didn't give any any constraints on the face. You see that these guys uh, act like gears, and uh, the face comes out automatically. So this is the unoptimized uh, mixing, and this one is the optimized mixing, and they nicely lock in here, here. This guy gets smashed. Okay, there's a cavity that pulls the neighboring uh, vortices into into the cavities on the left and the right and mixes it further. It checks it again and scratches it and so on and so on. You already see that this guy wants to participate. It reaches out to say, "Let me in too," uh, because there's something that is going <laughs> towards this guy. If we would probably go a little further and the guy gets into the mixed regime, then it will deform the shape and say, okay, now I can contribute to and scratch this thing that is coming towards me. So uh, uh, whereas the other one is not even close. Okay. So we get mixing strategy, gear-like shearing of vortices. So you can imagine there's a lot to play around with and, and, uh, and have fun. It's the only, the only disadvantage is that each of these simulations runs, runs uh, quite slowly, uh, even on a supercomputer. So you have to wait until you see nice results. Nevertheless. Oops. OK. What are the remaining challenges? This is where we currently are. Of course, we're going to continue with this one. We're just having too much fun with this. Uh, but there is definitely challenges and certain limitations. The, the biggest one, the elephant in the room here, is that we only can go for a local optimum. We have a nonlinear equation. We have a, a non-L2 measure. We have a fractional derivative mix norm. We have constraints and so on. This is not a convex optimization problem. Okay? So there's no guarantee whatsoever that we're going to a global optimum. We only can guarantee a local optimum when the gradient is zero. That's when we stop. We don't know whether across the hill there is another optimum that is actually better. We don't know how to get there. Okay? But as I said in the beginning, I say that again, one billion US dollars, that's all I need to say. Even if we're doing better in the local valley, that translates in a lot of money. Okay. So we're actually quite happy with uh, the optimization on a local scale. But sooner or later, we have to face up and do something on the global scale. And in that respect, um, probably something that is even derivative free might be a good candidate. We have to ha have additional constraint handling capabilities. The length of the optimization window is also a limitation. Because the further you go out, we, we had t is equal to 8. Okay? That was very well chosen because t is equal to 20 or 30 or so. You're mixing so much that the sensitivity that comes back is basically useless information. Okay? That goes a little bit towards optimization of turbulent flow that is very sensitive. Okay? You have diverging Lapunov exponents, and sooner or later, the uncertainty that you have from just having a positive Lapunov exponent overwhelms the information you're trying to get back to do a better optimization. Okay? So we're, doing, we're propagating sensitivity information back, and there's too much, too much noise over signal that we cannot make anything out, out of it if the window is too long. Also, we want to go to higher Reynolds number as much as we can push it, and also a different ratio of Reynolds to Peckley number so that we're getting closer into a fluids mixing problem than this one is closer to a gas mixing problem. 
and we also want to evaluate the robustness of the stirring strategy. What, you, you've seen these very subtle vortex collisions. What if we don't get it right? Do they still collide or not? How, how sort of how, how fine-tuned uh, or how custom-made is this mixing strategy? And if something is a little bit off, can we actually still get decent mixing results? A few extensions for the next steps. We want to do non-Newtonian fluids and see how they react and how they mix. So that one should have uh, industry listen up a little bit more than they care about it now. Uh, we also want to do simultaneous shape and path optimization of the stirrers. We also want to have the, the, the stirrers not go on the circle, but maybe on the Fourier curve by itself, a like, little bit like Lisa Shu figures. Okay. We also want to optimize the wall corrugation. You've seen a lot of vortices bashing into the wall. What happens if there is actually a nice corrugation on the wall that splits it nicer? Or a motion on the wall that goes back and forth and rocks back and forth and does additional mixing. Okay. Also, injection mixing would be very nice where we don't have a, a vessel that needs to be mixed. Actually, the, we have a flow through. We have a source and a sink where something comes into, unmixed into a vessel, then gets mixed by stirrers and gets sucked out, mixed on the other side. Okay. In this case, this is actually a very hard problem because the mixed norm has problems. The mixed norm is only defined for a closed system. Okay. And then also uh, passive mixing, for example, including baffles that just sit there and break up the, the fluid structures as they come by. But overall, the conclusion is that we're quite happy with what we have. This is another optimization where things just jiggle around. And then the stirrers are not doing anything now. They just sit there. But the vortices that they generated actually is doing all the mixing. We're quite happy with that gradient-based optimization. It's very effective. It's slow. But uh, um, nevertheless, it gets the job done. Uh, the proper mixing objective is a very, very important ingredient. I'm going to repeat that again. The mix norm is the one that actually saved us and gave us these nice results. And you have to, you cannot just push the button and hope that the optimizer will find something. You have to constrain it and you have to put all the physical knowledge that you have into that, into that system so, uh, to, to come up with the right constraints so that the optimization that you actually get and the optimal stirring design that you get at the end actually makes sense. So with this, thank you a lot for your attention. I'll be happy to answer some questions. Lord, open for questions for Peter. have some sense of how well you're solving it at the global level because for instance with um, when you like penalize the acceleration it seemed like you did better with respect to the original more than without the penalization. Yeah, yeah. Even though that's like a subset of that's uh, that's correct. So yeah, yeah. So it, it, it's it's very difficult to compare. You know, you you, you change when you when you change more uh, when you change the penalization and you and introduce the acceleration penalization the path of the optimization goes directly somewhere else, right? And since we don't know the optimization landscape of what valley is the deepest, there's very little we can actually do to compare where would have it ended up if we had a milder penalization or a stronger penalization. So it's, 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 it's I think, beyond the reach of, of, uh, of what we can calculate. Yeah, Bernard. How sensitive are uh, things with the uh, perspective of the exponent minus two thirds? If you had a minus one half there or a minus one, how different would these pictures look? Uh, not, not too different. Not too different. We, we tried the minus one. Uh, the minus one half, I think, is not used very often. At least there's not much in the literature. It's usually minus one and minus two thirds. Uh, the minus two thirds has a little bit more of a mathematical basis than the minus one. Minus one is easier from the implementation. Uh, we tried both minus one and minus two third, and the the play, the balance between the strategies is about the same. The specific details, you know, comparing times uh, snapshot by snapshot, that is very difficult because it takes a different optimization path. So you may end up with something else. But overall, what it uses as a as a mixing strategy is about the same. So there's still collision with the wall, collision with the vortices, the vortex cannon 
the, the start looks almost the same, and then they diverge a little bit. But the overall picture is the same. Yeah, KK. Thank you. Uh, very nice talk. Thanks. Um, the question is, um, you see, the problem you pose is one where it's, it's sort of idealistic, where you have a mixed fluids <laughs> sitting there you want to mix them. Yeah. Have you considered a strategy where instead of having them already sitting there, you eject them from the site, one desert, um, one of one kind, the other one of the other kind, yeah. but consider the strategy of, um, of that. But active or passive? Uh, active, with, 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 with things on paths. Well, that, that would yeah, be a, yeah. a, a more complicated one, even with the, the, the cylinders yeah. rotating and the nozzles. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, but not let them all sit there, not mix first. You have two nozzles, so one of one kind of food, the other. Like yeah. Yes. yeah. So, so that would be, that would be the, the, the second one from the bottom, the injection mixing, where you have a source and a sink. They come in from one side and the other side, unmixed, and they mix in a, in a, in a, in a vessel in, a, in, in between. And then the optimization, for example, would be a baffle system that you push them through and mix them. Right. right? Uh, the way I understood yeah. you said that was source and sink and mix fluid and sucking them out. Yeah. Uh, I wasn't thinking of that. I was thinking of before you got the fluids, they're sitting there separated. Yeah. You you inject them uh, of two kinds, one in, one in, and then fill them up. Uh, yeah, yeah. pre-mixed. Pre uh, we, we, we haven't looked at that yet. Yeah. We haven't looked at that. There's, there's, there's so many avenues that we can go down. Uh, it's, there's, there's, there's plenty of us for, for us to do. But that, that's, uh, that's, that's probably more closer to industrial mixing. Yeah, 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 good point. Any no, not yet. But uh, this one goes. This one is point number one. You know, where surrogate modeling techniques have a higher chance of going to uh, going to a global minimum. And uh, there's a lot of progress in the surrogate uh, 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 optimization community, where now what used to have hundreds and thousands evaluations to get a decent surrogate surface. Now they're coming into the range of about 40 to 50 function evaluations. A function evaluation is a, is a simulation for us, right? And 40 to 50, if you look that we're doing about 11 or 12 of these round trips, that one is the order of magnitude that we also would get for, a, for building a surrogate model. It's about the same cost. If you throw in checkpointing on top of that, you have to add another 50%. So we're at about 30 to 35 simulations as we converge to our gradient-based optimization. And 30 to 35 is almost what the best surrogate models can do in terms of getting a global optimum. So these things become very viable candidates. So we, we have thought about it, but we haven't really engaged in that. Yes, but we're well aware of, of the, the non-derivative-free optimization. Uh, we ha we haven't. I, I know that uh, we, we modeled the whole the whole uh, petri dish thing, uh, the whole geometry, after a uh, experiment that is run at uh, Saint Gobain uh, uh, Research Labs in France. They actually do the real thing with about the same Reynolds number. The Peckley number is a lot lower in their case, so we have to come down on the Peckley number. But the setup is more or less the same, and that's sort of the benchmark. It's, it's still very academic and very contrived, not even close to what they need in, uh, in, in, in mixing glass. But, uh, but at least we can hook up with them and, uh, and see whether they can run an experiment for us so we can verify it. Right now, we're not quite in the same parameter regime. So we would have to redo that. Uh, uh, well, it's 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 mostly well the, the the Reynolds number of course 
it sets the viscosity of the fluid, but then it's the ratio of the Reynolds number to the Peclet number that that quantifies whether you're more on the mixing of fluids or more in the regime of mixing of, of gas-like structures. Uh, in, in our parameter setting, we're a little far away from a fluid mixing and more in, a, in the regime of a gas mixing, although not quite. So we would have to, uh, uh, a simulation for fluid mixing, typical fluid mixing would probably have a Reynolds number of about 10,000 and a Peclet number of about 100. So there is a 100 to 1 ratio between the Peckley and Reynolds number. In our case, it's 1. And if you have a 100 ratio between uh, Reynolds and Peckley number, you're very close to approaching uh, or, or, or covering a fluid structure, a, flu a fluid mixing interaction. So that's definitely on the high on the list of what we need to do. And then hook up to the, to the French guys with, uh, with the experiment and see whether they see the same thing. Any more questions? Now we're gonna have a nice little coffee break. Stir it up with milk. Stir it up with milk. Yeah, right yeah. Right out the side of the here. Yeah, yeah. So it's right over here. I, 